The purpose of this podcast is simple. We want you to get to know your doctor before meeting them in person because you're making a life-changing decision and time is scarce. The more you can learn about who your doctor is before you meet them, the better that first meeting will be. There is no substitute for an in-person appointment, but we hope this comes close. I'm your host, Eva Shea, and you're listening to Meet the Doctor. Welcome back to Meet the Doctor. My guest on the podcast today is Larry Weinstein, and he is a plastic surgeon based in Chester, New Jersey. So welcome, Dr. Weinstein. Hi, Ava. How are you? Great. Where is Chester? Chester is a little bit west of Morristown, just west of Mendham, east of Long Valley and Hackettstown, south of Newton, and north of Somerville or Far Hills. It's a beautiful town small town and it's beautiful this time of year in the autumn with the changing leaves and uh, we have the U.S. equestrian team and a lot of golf courses. We have plenty of free parking in my parking lot. I have my own surgical center, private. Are you the only plastic surgeon in Chester? Yes, uh, and the only one in my office as well. And I do all the surgery and fillers and Botox myself. Can you answer the phone yourself too? On a rare occasion, <laughs> on a rare occasion. But I have women who are working for me for 34 years, uh-huh. 30 They're years, like 27 years. Yeah, they like family. And they treat our patients like family also. Mm-hmm. So tell me more about them. What are their names and what are they like? Well, Veronica is a, a zany person who is very lovable. And she has uh, three children. And she's very receptionist now, but she's a trained nurse as well. But she likes being a receptionist and talking to patients more than nursing. But she's a very capable nurse as well. And I have Maria, who does all my collections. She's Sicilian, so you don't mess with her. <laughs> oh, I suppose you don't. <laughs> so, the Sicilian, you don't want to mess with her. And then... Uh... Is there anybody else? No, she's a very sweet woman, you know. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, but, you know, I can't talk to people about money, and she handles that aspect of my office, and I really appreciate what she does. And then there's Liz, who's with me for 34 years, who does my bookkeeping and keeps me, mm-hmm. keeps the business running. And so, have you been in Chester this whole time? The entire time, 35 years. Okay, so take us back in time a little bit. Where were you before Chester? You came out of training? Did you come out of a group? What did you do? So I was in training in New York City Mm -hmm. at the State University of New York, Brooklyn, Kings County, downstate, Methodist Hospital. And I trained with some of the best surgeons in New York and also had training at Columbia and Cornell University and uh, came out into private practice, a very capable surgeon. And my first patients were local people who had accidents, so I took care of Next thing I know, their entire family was coming to me because I was had some successful outcomes, thank God. And I had a partner after I was in practice for five years who was very capable. And I focused on aesthetic surgery from that point on in my practice. And I do mostly face and neck lifts, and breast augmentation, and liposculpture. And I was one of the first people to um, embrace Botox and have been doing it from the inception of Botox availability and have even spoken about the use of Botox in New York City for other plastic surgeons. And also I've spoken at local plastic surgery meetings, national plastic surgery meetings, and international plastic surgery meetings on my unique Z-lift face neck lift procedure that I've honed over 30 years and very minimal downtime and maximum outcome. But certainly I... No one can guarantee results, but with uh, delicate hands and experience, outcomes are usually very good, thank God. Now, why is it called the Z-lift? Because it involves a, an internal Z, imbrication of the SMAS, or a deep plane. In other words, there are fascia underneath the skin which should be elevated for a face or neck lift is a muscle and a neck called a platysma. And if we elevate that platysma muscle with an imbrication or smash or deep plane, we then get a more long-lasting result 
and less of a problem with those participant bands in the neck. And we get a nice clean look, but not a strange look. The most important thing to me is to have someone look relaxed and refreshed and rejuvenated and not to have a strange look. One of the biggest fear patients have for a facelift is that they might come out looking strange. I've seen strange facelifts and people come to me to try to fix that. And certain things I can't fix and I don't accept and will not do. So on one hand, I've had patients who were in the 80s who uh, wanted further facelifting and a little nip and tuck can be done for these older women who have jowls or who have obtuse angles at the neck. And there are also younger women who sometimes lose a lot of weight suddenly from cancer or after childbirth. And all of a sudden they look like older ladies when they're in their 30s. And all the filler in the world is not gonna fix it. But a little simple Z-lift is gonna give them back the zip that they deserve. Does this kind of facelift hold up for a very long time? Is not something that has to be redone later or? Not necessarily. I mean, most people in my practice are one and done. You know, they have it once in their lifetime and they're done. There are other patients who I have who are more, more in the um, limelight of uh, practice or business and they want to look young and they want to be look refreshed. And I have uh, like, accountants, doctors, lawyers who come in every four months for their Botox every three months. We have a new Daxify, which can last six to nine months, which I've recently used on myself, and I love it. So, and I love the result it has for my patients. Now, in terms of facelifts, your specific question was, do it, does it have to be redone? And I've had patients over 30 years who have had three facelifts, you know, or brow lifts or eyelids. So, different times in people's lives, they notice things in the aging process that they want to fix. And if it's fixable, I'll do it. I had a patient in just yesterday who was asking me about having her eyelids done. And she's 80 years old. And I looked at her eyes. There is no extra skin. I cannot make it any better than it is. <laughs> and although she's thinking about this thing as being a problem for her, it's not a problem. It's just her skin texture is not the best. So we did a fractionated laser for her to tighten her skin a little bit. And I prescribed a product for her to help her skin be as refreshed as possible. I mean, there's limitations to what we can do. And if it's, surgery is not going to help somebody, I'm not going to even talk about it. I don't want to take people's money for something that's not going to help them. How have you approached the sort of changing technology over the decades? You know, you, you have certainly a long view of having been doing this for 34 years in the same place with the same people. I try to embrace every new technology. I check out every new technology, but I am not going to experiment on my patients. You know, I'll experiment on myself before I'll <laughs> experiment on a patient. It's like cool sculpting. Mm -hmm. I tried out school sculpting. I put it on one side of my tummy and I saw what the results were. I actually had a paradoxical effect. It actually increased the fat on that side of my tummy. Oh, Not a wow. lot, but it was, and I've talked to the people who utilize cool sculpting a lot, and they said, yes, that does happen more ha often in men than women. Little did I know that that would be the case. However, liposculpture, liposuction is a very effective technique. When I remove fat cells from somebody, they're gone. They're not coming back. I mean, if you gain weight, you can gain it someplace else. But once I've removed the fat from someplace, there is no way it can come back. That's the thing I like about the permanence of liposculpture. And I've been doing that for over 35 years. And do you also use fat for rejuvenation in the face? Okay, so I've been doing fat grafting for 37 years. And there's no question that fat is helpful in certain places and locations and in limited amount. When you try to do too much of it, I think it causes a problem and it resorbs. Now, I see women there are so into phys being physically fit and exercising. So if you're a man or a woman who's exercising vigorously every day, if I take those fat cells and move them someplace, the chances are you're going to burn them out. They need time in order to gain blood vessels and gain the support and nutrition that they need. So if you're exercising vigorously on a regular basis, fat grafting is really not for you. It's not going to work. It's just going to dissolve really quickly. At best, fat grafting, only about 50% of it stays. And I've been using tried and true techniques for fat grafting, and I like to do it in a limited fashion for limited locations as an additive to the Z-Lift. 
I also use fillers. Like the fillers I like is Voluma. Voluma lasts up to two years, can be used in the cheeks. I use the uh, Juvederma RHAs in the nasal labial folds. I use it in the jowl region in the chin or in the mandibular region. And there's a new product that can help rejuvenate the skin a little bit, which I'm trying out. It just came out just last month, was approved. So that uh, as new technologies come and evolve, I oh, will try them beef? out. And use Is that them what you're talking beef. about? Yes, I have it in my office. I Did you do it to yourself? It. No, I didn't. My <laughs> face looks, I have good skin. I am very lucky. I don't go in the sun, in the sun that much and I use sunscreen. I have a broad rimmed hat that I wear when I play golf. And my friends wear these caps and now they're having like little problems with their ears from skin cancers and stuff. I think it's important to protect your skin. It's only one envelope we're going to have. You're not going to get another one. If uh, someone's coming to see you for the first time for a consultation or for, for any reason, what can they expect from that? They can expect a doctor who's going to listen to them and hear about what bothers them. Because that's the most important thing in my consultation, is focusing in on what the patient is concerned about. Subsequent to that, I'm going to focus in on a full examination, either it's either the face or the body. And I will examine the face in terms of proportions, in terms of the bony aspects, and the skin envelope and the muscle envelope. And I will recommend to them what can be fixed and what can't. I will point out things to them if they're amenable to it. If they don't want to hear about it, I am not going to pick on somebody. The other thing is when I do a body consultation, I want to examine the entire body. I want to examine the chest, the abdomen, the waist, and the hips. And I want that to be proportional. If someone's coming to me for a breast augmentation or a breast reduction, I'm going to talk to them about proportions. I'm going to measure them. And we're going to talk about how we can make that body be more proportional and more acceptable to them in terms of what they wear, you know, because it's about how garments fit you, and how you present yourself, and how you feel about yourself. I think ultimately, I'm not going to talk about any surgical procedures with somebody if I don't feel like they're going to feel better about themselves when I'm done with what we're doing. Do you ever find that? what people want and what you think they should do or don't always line up? Yeah, that's a big no-no. That's a big no-no. I mean, I had a dentist one time who came in, he wanted liposuction of his stomach. And sure, he would have been a good candidate for liposuction of his stomach, but he had a problem with atrial fibrillation and he was on anticoagulants. So I said, you know, if you were my brother, I wouldn't do liposuction. Why don't you just go on a diet? Weight Watchers is probably one of the best methods you could use for losing weight. And that's what I recommend to you. And he said, no, my cardiologist told me I could go ahead. You know, he'll take me off the anticoagulants. Okay. I said, but then what's your risk of having a blood clot from your heart, you know, to your brain? And, you know, you're a dentist. You have life to live. You know, that's more important than having a little liposuction. And I said, if you were my brother, I wouldn't do it. So I didn't. Was he upset with you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Was he the local dentist? He was like the next couple towns over. Okay. But I've operated on a local dentist, but I can't tell you which one. No, of There's course a few not. Of them. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, in a small town, I can't imagine how often... You probably know everyone everywhere you go. Well, I mean, you know, the mayor's been in to see me. I've helped her out with different yeah. issues during uh, the pandemic. My office was open for local lacerations and hand injuries because that was the only thing I was able to do with during the pandemic. But now we're open for business. Thank God people are vaccinated. The cavalry came in with the vaccines. Not everybody's gotten vaccinated, but that's okay. I think we've developed enough immunity to the problems that we've been dealing with. And thank God we're in a better state of things. Yeah. So when, you, when you're out like at the grocery store, do you just pretend you don't know people until they come up to you? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, but some people, you know, they just, I'm in the hospital, people come over and hug me in the grocery store, it happens as well. And, oh, it's a terrible problem you know. to have. Well, look, <laughs> you never have enough hugs in life. <laughs> it's true. It's true. My, aunt, my it. aunt Molly gave the best hugs. <laughs> Where did you grow up? I grew up in Brooklyn. Oh, okay. I can hear that. How did you decide that you were going to go to medical school? Is there a story there? There's a story there. Well, 
You know what? The, probably the best story I have is how I found my office in Chester. I went out fishing with a good friend of mine and his son. And we had the two boys. They were about four years old. We went fishing. We caught a fish. We cooked the fish. We camped out. And on the way home, I passed the office in Chester Woods Professional Park. And it was a new complex. It was an award-winning complex for the architecture. I had won an award for some of my research from the Plastic Surgery Society. So I had an epiphany. I figured they won an award, I won an award. I'm going to open my office here in Chester. And I've been here 35 years happily. And I still go fishing. And my son and I have a very good relationship, as well as my children and grandchildren. Tell me more about your family. Well, my son is a filmmaker. He was involved in a very interesting film called Flying on One Engine about a Dr. Sharad Kumar Dixie who go, went to India for six months a year doing surgery for children. And it was a beautiful film about him. And I also went, uh, I've gone probably 25 times to India at different locations to do surgery for children. And I was with Dr. Dixie when he the day before he passed, and I try to bring his spirit every year to India. I'll be going there in January this year to do surgery for children, cleft lips, cleft noses, and, uh, you know, bring his spirit there to help people. Uh, poor people have been here. They're so poor. Cool. But uh, I lo love uh, the effects I have on patients' lives in Chester. It gives me no greater pleasure to see the confidence patients have when they leave my office. Uh, several weeks after a surgery. It's just very heartwarming. And I love to see their families. I mean, I've had three sisters that came for facelifts. I've had three sisters that have come for breast augmentations. You know, and I've had generations where uh, a mother, a grandmother had breast augmentation, the daughter had breast augmentation, and the granddaughter now has come. So I, I love the fact that uh, people have, I've earned the trust from people to get the results that they expect. I mean, obviously, you can't guarantee anything, and on a rare occasion, things will go wrong. But I'm always there for patients, no matter what happens, to make sure that they do well. And I don't, I'm not going to force you into early retirement, but how much longer are you going to work? I see myself uh, practicing for at least another five years. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then more fishing. Well, I, there's only so much time I can go fishing and play golf. You know, I mean, there's a certain amount of, you know, love for my craft. I mean, my brain is still working. My hands are still working very well. Mm -hmm. And my eyes are still great. So as long as I have those three things, I'm going to continue. Yeah. Well, they're lucky to have you there in Chester. Thank you so much, Abe. It's really been a pleasure talking to you. If we want to find out more about you, where can we find you online? You can find me at www.docweinstein, D-O-C Weinstein.com. And uh, you can email me directly at lwplastics, L-W-P-L-A-S-T-I-C-S at AOL.com. Thank you, Dr. Weinstein. It was a pleasure getting to know you. Thank you. If you're considering making an appointment or are on your way to meet this doctor, be sure to let them know you heard them on the Meet the Doctor podcast. Check the show notes for links, including the doctor's website and Instagram to learn more. Are you a doctor or do you know a doctor who'd like to be on the Meet the Doctor podcast? Book your free recording session at meetthedoctorpodcast.com. Meet the Doctor is made with love in Austin, Texas, and is a production of The Axis, T-H-E-A-X-I-S dot I-O.